All right, we're back. We have Eric Meta on for the third time. I think Eric, you're our now uh, highest frequency guest outside of the the E3 crew. So, thanks oh, wow. for coming on awesome. again. For people who haven't listened to the prior two episodes, can you just give a brief intro on yourself? Yeah, um, I'm a, been a physical therapist well over 20 years, a uh, strength and conditioning specialist as well. Um, you know, sports specialists. Et cetera, et cetera. Um, most of my work has been actually in professional education um, and working with uh, mostly elite athletes. Um, so a lot of, you know, educating physical therapists, strength coaches, athletic trainers on rehab, on science, how science works, um, on strength and conditioning principles, uh, and a lot on biomechanics. And so I put on a lot of that kind of content, both online and person. Um, and then I do a lot of consulting as well with different uh, professional sports teams. And the last time you were on with Mark, I think it was the end of 2022. You, we discussed the, the new course you had published, I think within that year or two prior, fully online course on applying science to practice. What updates since we chatted last at the end of last year, I know you had the big basketball kind of summit or conference. Maybe you want to dive into how that went and then any other changes or updates within the past year? Yeah, that was the biggest thing. So uh, what we did is uh, the NBA does their summer league every year in Las Vegas. Um, and so saw an opportunity there that uh, a, a lot of the physical therapists that were working, <clears throat> excuse me, physical therapists and athletic trainers that were working in the uh, professional basketball space and college basketball space were talking about how much they wanted the ability to get together and have some sort of a conference where they can kind of discuss ideas. And so I thought that's something I can definitely put together. Uh, I have enough contacts with NBA and NCAA that we can uh, put something together. I reached out to UNLV. We put together a conference on their campus during Summer League uh, last July. Uh, it was a huge hit. It actually sold out in six hours. <laughs> so um, we had to uh, go back to UNLV and say we need more space uh, because we can definitely go larger than what we originally planned. We just didn't want to overextend ourselves. And so uh, we ended up with around 150 people, um, sold it out again. Uh, we decided we didn't want to go any bigger for that first iteration. Uh, we're going to do it again next year. We're going to do it a little bit bigger next year. Not not a lot, maybe closer to 200 uh, if if that many people register. Um, we're also open it up to have, um, strength and conditioning specialists or professionals working, uh, in with that group as well. Uh, again, with a focus on rehab, not performance, not acute management, but the, the rehab side. And so we find that rehab is the part that doesn't get picked up quite as well, uh, especially at that elite level. Uh, there's a lot of talk about what to do when an injury happens. There's a lot of talk uh, of performance, but bridging the two across is where there didn't seem to be a, a good network for that. And so the development that came from that was I had a bunch of people reach out to me and say, hey, can you do that for my sport? Um, so we're, we've got a hockey one already set up uh, that's going to happen in June next year. We haven't quite got it uh, announced other than, you know, making we're letting people know it's going to happen. It's, it's definitely we're working on it. Um, and then we're looking at a couple other leagues as well, uh, you know, just work on the logistics of that. So um, I just like this idea of having a very specialized space because, you know, people work in basketball, they want to know about basketball stuff. They don't want to know about like soccer or, or football or, or even just general population. They're very dialed into the group that they work with. Um, and so it's not a necessarily a conference for everyone, but there we're also opening it up and that's what we did this last year with basketball people who are interested in the sport and want to do work in the sport as well even if they're not in the space currently um they're more than welcome to come out and that's probably about half the audience that shows up uh and we get really good engagement from them which is really awesome the the really cool thing from this is um this basketball conference was by far the most diverse group of attendees I have ever seen at a conference I've, I've attended. Uh, so I was really happy to, to see that. Why do you think that was the case? Well, uh, we made a point to, uh, the, the, one of the points for the groups outside of the sport is that we're trying to bring down barriers. Uh, and we were hearing that from within the league as well as like, th they want to see more diversity in their staffs. 
but they don't have good pathways to, to reach out to more diverse people. You know, when you're looking to hire somebody, you look to your peer group, you look to your networking group, which tends to be people who look a lot like you who came up through the same channels you did. And so we're trying to use these conferences as a way to connect elite um, providers with people who want to get into that space. So I think just people saw the opportunity that, hey, um, also our presenters w was an extremely diverse group. Um, they didn't all look alike by any means. We, we made a point of uh, trying to pull in different voices. Um, and so I think people felt like they were seen and heard. And, um, you know, and that's the thing that we like, we had a networking event and, and the idea was for that they could network with people within elite basketball. But what I stressed to that group as well was this is for you to network with each other because you will be the next people in elite basketball and you will be able to get yourselves opportunities the more you network with each other. So it's not just looking at people who can bring you up, but people that you can connect with and develop a profession with collectively. Um, and so I, I think just providing that space and making sure that people understood that it was an open space for them was, was all really needed. Well, thanks for putting that together. I'm glad it went so well and you're expanding to other professional organizations. Very curious how the hockey one goes and the others moving forward. You would also, I think, mentioned to Mark in the last episode, you were kind of working out of a training facility outside of somewhere in Oregon, working with athletes, and then you also had a trainer. Is that still going on or have you been very busy with other things? That's still going on. It's, it's a very small level. I mean, I only do a few hours a, a week at this point. Uh, very highly specialized with, um, like I said, it's it's mostly either professional or collegiate athletes. Uh, a lot of consulting, like, hey, can you can you take a look at my case? Give me some ideas. Um, that kind of thing. Uh, it's in a training facility with a strength coach that also works with a lot of those populations. Um, and so there's, there's kind of good back and forth that we get to do with that. Um, but, but I pretty much, it's pretty small with that. I mean, anybody, you know, if they want to contact me, get on my schedule and their and I feel like their case is appropriate for me to work with, uh, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I don't, I don't exclude anybody in that way other than I know what I do and I know what I do really well. And I want to focus on that. Um, I'm kind of at that point in my career that, that I have that luxury. And then last question before we dive into it, how's the, the airplane flying going? <laughs> it's going well. I'm, uh, I need about 15 more hours to get my instrument rating. Um, and I need to do a couple more cross country, uh, and cross country just means trips of more than 50 miles or anywhere from 50 to 300 nautical miles of distance, uh, to get my commercial license. Um, and People are like, oh, so like to be a come an airline pilot. It's like, no, that's a, that's a that's what's known as an ATP, an air, airline, uh, sorry, airplane transport pilot. Um, commercial just means that people can pay you to take them up. Um, and so I really enjoy teaching, and I thought it'd be fun to teach people how to fly a plane. And so um, that would be something I I look to do in the future. That's great. If, this is a dumb question. What's the difference between normal miles and nautical miles? Oh, so a nautical mile is basically one uh, minute of latitude. So, you know, you think of latit Latin long. Uh, so longitude, technically at the equator, longitude and latitude are the same distance. They're a nautical mile. Um, but latitude stays the same distance all the way as you head north, where longitude as you head north, they become shorter than a nautical mile. So you always use latitude. And so, yeah, minutes... Uh, minutes of latitude uh, is a is a nautical mile, which is a little longer than a statute mile, which is your standard you know mile. Um, honestly, the nautical mile is probably the most the one that makes the most sense. People are always like, well, kilometers. It's like, well, just because it divides out by tens, I mean, it's just a kilometer is still an arbitrary distance. A nautical mile actually makes sense because it, it's taking a globe and dividing it into units. Um, and so that's a nautical mile. And then a knot would be, uh, like if you hear something's going 20 knots or 130 knots or something like that, that's nautical miles per hour is what a knot is. So. Got it. Okay. 
let's dive into the topic. So you published an article in mid-August on your website, The Science PT, The Said Principle Always Applies. And I read it and it, it's a relatively short read. I, I think people should read it before they listen to the rest of this. But I wanted to get you on because I think it, establishing what the said principle means in your differential between viewing this as a healing process versus an adaptation process, I think would be a really good discussion. So can you initially explain just kind of basically what the set principle, what it stands for, and then maybe where it was rooted and typically like what people think of it. And then we can kind of go down through the article piece by piece. Yeah. I mean, the set principle is, uh, you know, it's just an acronym, so it's really easy to, uh, to remember it. It's, uh, you know, um, specific adaptation to impose the bands. Um, and so all that saying is that, you know, when you apply any sort of demand to an organism in general, it is going to adapt um, to that very specifically. Uh, so, you know, it gets into ideas like specificity, um, meaning that, um, you know, it's, it, the human body is insanely specific when it's provided a stimulus. So you, you give it a stimulus and it's going to adapt specifically to that stimulus. Um, this is where we get into, uh, you know, we talk about like skill acquisition, you know, they'll talk about near transfer versus far transfer. I'm of the belief that far transfer is not a thing. Um, far transfer and what that means is uh near transfer means how close to the thing you're doing is this going to the skill going to transfer so you know if you're working on squatting as a skill that squatting is just making you better at squatting it's not making you better at uh at jumping as a skill you know keeping that in mind that's what i'm talking about you know, jumping is farther of a transfer and again, as a skill. So that's not to say that squatting won't you make you better at jumping because squatting gives you more capacity that you're going to use when jumping. So you have more capacity accessible to you. But the adaptation is to the skill of squatting as a skill and the force requirements. So the muscle activation, the, the load requirements, basically, so not just muscle, but all the other tissues, you know, cartilage, everything else is adapting to those loads, but it's specifically adapting to the loads that are being applied to it. So it'll be able to ho tolerate or, or it is learning to adapt and adapting to those specific loads as, as they would, um, uh, apply there. And so, yeah, it, it, it would transfer to jumping as a capacity, but not necessarily as a skill. The initial uh, point you make is kind of explaining the limitations of this concept, the set principle. So let's just start there. What are the realities of the set principle and uh, the imposed demands and adaptations from those? Yeah, so we're, you know, if you, if you think of, um, you know, the, the, there's all these little kind of laws that are just kind of common sense laws, uh, like a, the law of diminishing returns, so to speak. So, you know, when you do a little bit of work, you, you get a lot of kind of results. But then as you continue to do more and more work to get more and more result, you have to put a lot more into it. Um, you, you could hear like the 80-20 rule is one of those. So the 20% of work that gets you 80% of the results. And then there's the 80% of work just to get those last 20% of results. And so the said principle kind of falls into that as well uh, as I've seen it kind of in, in the real world. And th these are, you know, your your general outpatient clients who've never lifted a weight before and they go and lift some weights for a little bit and you see huge gains really quickly. Um, it's like, yeah, because they've, they've put no stimulus into their system before. And so, you know, you get these kind of huge gains at the initial part of it, but that's not linear. So, you know, as you go, um, it takes a while before you actually get um, you know, once, once you get to a certain point, you kind of plateau a little bit and then it takes lots and lots and lots and lots of demand in order to get any more adaptation. And, and you kind of get to a point and it's like, and I think I mentioned that in the article, you know, is it, is it possible you get to the point where you can lift 
you know, 600 pounds, for example, based on your genetics, keep in mind that your genetics uh, has a, a huge factor here. It's like, yeah, but it may take you more hours than are in the day worth of work. So it's, it's, it's technically possible, but also technically impossible because there's just not enough time in the day. You just kind of get to a point where you've maximized your genetics and that's all you're going to get. Um, it's, it's not that the said principle stops. It's just that the, the returns on your investment, so to speak, just become extremely small. So that's kind of a, a limitation to it. But also it kind of becomes a, an advantage, specifically when you're dealing with like early in rehab. It takes very little, you know, kind of demand to create, you know, those early changes. Like if somebody's had surgery and like, let's say, you know, they've had like a, you know, a labor repair or something like that. Uh, it doesn't take much load for that labrum to start to heal down. As a matter of fact, too much load is probably going to make that repair not take because you're pushing it off. But on the same note, zero load whatsoever to the labrum would cause it not to heal together. Um, you know, it's, it's always kind of it just the body asking the question of what do I need to be strong against? And if you put no load on it, the body's going to be like, great, I don't need to take any load. I don't need any sort of resiliency to this. I don't need any sort of strength to, to, to withstand this. But then as you apply load to it, it starts to go, oh, I need to adapt to this. And the idea there is in the early phases, it's like, oh, it seems like you don't really have to do anything. And it just, quote unquote, heals. Um, it's, well, you're not doing nothing. You're still doing something. But you're in that phase that very little takes you a long way. But you end up with this huge gap in the middle. And this is kind of what I was just talking about before about like with those rehab conferences. You have this gap in the middle where you had the initial healing and then you have performance on the other side. But there's this huge gap in the middle to bridge all the way over there. And I just see too many athletes where they kind of they tried resting it to wellness and then just returned to their activity because they always just kind of did their activity before there was never a bridge they had to cross before. And so they, they miss that kind of gap there and they either get re-injured or they start to find new ways to do the tasks that they're doing without loading the area. Going back to the, the further out you make these adaptations, the harder it is to get subsequent adaptations from a skill acquisition standpoint. Is that similar? Like early in the process, it's easier to learn a task or to acquire a new skill, or can that be uh, a different idea or rule where there is maybe less of an immediate mm, kind of learning component? I'm thinking like in particular of trying to teach someone a hinge, there can be like weeks or months where they just don't understand and then it like yeah. flicks all of a sudden. Um, so there's not this like kind of linear or proportional increase. What are your thoughts from a skill acquisition versus like a, a physiological adaptation perspective? Yeah, I mean that gets into like some of your like how do how how do neural networks learn a task? Um and I use that phrase because that's how uh human brains are considered, animal brains, but then also what we're seeing with like machine learning and artificial intelligence, the preferred term is a neural network. Um uh, because that's what it's trying to be. Although the neural networks we have in artificial intelligence are nothing like we have with with humans. Um, but yeah, what you'll see is you know as you kind of pump information into there, it takes um, it takes very little for it to get like a general idea, but then it takes a mountain for it actually to do anything substantial with it. And so an example here would be, um, I'm, I'm thinking of some of these like kind of like lifelong games that people, sports that people play, like golf would be an example of it. I'm not a golfer, so I can't comment too far on that. But the basics of swinging a golf club, I mean, you can put a golf club in anybody's hand and just give them a general gist of it, and they're going to swing a golf club, okay? It's not going to take them long to learn that what looks somewhat like a professional golfer's swing, and again, somewhat like it the large gross movements, but then to fine tune that takes thousands, I would say millions of repetitions to actually get to the point where you have that true skill set of like a professional golfer. Um, and so that's where, you know, this kind of applies in that same way of, of just being able to do the basic task. Um, 
beyond as opposed to achieving full proficiency. And this is something, you know, in the aviation world, this is a big thing because that's why pilots talk about how many hours they have of, of time in type. So the specific aircraft they're flying, for example, that's a big thing that they have to deal with. But they also talk about um, the term proficiency. So do you have enough hours to be legal? But then are you proficient? And, you know, sometimes it's another thing you have to look at is, you know, yes, you may have your pilot's license, but your proficiency may not be up to all that that license allows you to do. So, yeah, technically you can go out and fly with only three miles of visibility and a uh, 2000 foot ceiling. But that probably wouldn't be a good thing to do. And with, you know, a 15 knot crosswind or something, you know, all this. Crazy, it's like, yeah, legally you can. But you need to be your own kind of assessor there. And then it's it's a matter of, you know, and you look at these pilots with thousands and thousands of, you have to have thousands of hours before you can, you know, work for a, a commercial air carrier. Um, but it's that same thing of, of, yeah, the gist of it from a skill acquisition thing to actual proficiency is, you know, a mile wide. You already alluded to it, but in the next section of the article, the diving into this, uh, said principle applying to athletic injuries so the the thing you see the most commonly or this idea of you need to rest and allow for full recovery and healing what why is that not correct well people get this this kind of misconception that the rest is causing the area to heal um it's not i i don't want people to think of it that way rest is definitely necessary but it's not actually and, and and this is where people get messed up if they think that the rest is causing the healing then they think more rest will equal more healing and no the rest is creating an environment to allow adaptation to happen and so again back to that said principle it's an adaptation that's occurring and it's occurring according to the demands that are placed on it when you give it rest, you're giving it an opportunity, you know, when something is, is acutely injured or like immediately post-operatively, it's kind of fragile. It doesn't need much load in order for it to, to you know, if you put too much load in it, you're going to damage the, the area that's been injured um, or the area that's been repaired or reconstructed via surgery. And so you have to just put that little subtle bit of load. And again, non-weight bearing uh in a brace you're still putting little variations of load in there and that's enough for that initial healing uh but then you have to start putting more and more weight on it as you go and, and unfortunately with people again that idea is oh they were resting and allowing it to heal it's like no you're stimulating it to adapt in the way that you want it to but there's a big difference between full weight bearing going for a walk and running and cutting and, you know, doing your sport. Um, and the gap between that, you know, that's again, that part that people, you know, they, they try to basically just jump over that and just go back to the sport. They get re-injured. Uh, and then they're kind of confused by, Oh, I didn't rest long enough. I didn't wait long enough. And I hear this all the time. Oh, we rushed them back too soon. It's like, no time. Isn't necessarily the thing it's did it, did it adapt? You know, some people adapt at different rates than others. Um, you know, some people can can adapt to load faster. Again, genetics have a big play on this, but it wasn't a matter of just it just needed more rest and more time. That time needs to be purposeful of of kind of some sort of a loading progression for that. You differentiate between the specific adaptation to impose demand, and not the specific healing to impose treatment. I think that's essentially what you're saying, but if there's anything else you feel like you want to elaborate on of this, it's not the specific healing to them post-treatment. Can you define or explain a little bit more of what that mistake is? Yeah. So a, a lot of our treatments, so to speak, you know, are, you know, a lot of the like feel good type things, you know, oh, we just need to, you know, work on recovery and that kind of thing. What it's doing is, again, it's just kind of placating the symptoms. Um, people get this idea that it's causing healing when it's not actually doing anything like that. 
Um, and so that's kind of where I was getting at with that in particular is, is that these treatments are not actually healing anything. They're just, you know, they're not causing any harm by any means. Um, and so some people say, well, exercise is treatment. It's like, well, but again, don't think of it as a treatment. Think of it as an out of, out of application of load, uh, and then doing it purposefully. I think what people do too many times as well is they're doing kind of these kind of nonsense exercises that are not really putting much load into anything. If anything, they're just building somebody's confidence that they can do a ta they can do an activity. But if it's not loaded appropriately, you're not bridging that gap still. Uh, and sometimes I think that actually does an athlete harm is when you're doing a lot of these like quote unquote functional movements that are not really loaded and they're called like coordination exercises and things like that. And again, remember coordination is a very specific thing that can become more coordinated at your exercise. That doesn't mean it's going to transfer to that. That coordination is going to transfer to the sport. Remember it's the, it's the load adaptation that's going to transfer the best. And so if your coordination activity does not have enough load to it, um, let me actually back that up. Your coordination activity is not a coordination activity. It is a load activity and it's probably way under loaded. And so it is not actually causing any healing. It's not causing any real significant adaptation. It's causing some, but it's just at such a low level that, you know, you know, and that's what I get at a lot is, you know, be purposeful about it. Think about how much load are you applying? How are you making this progression actually get there? Um, a lot of times you'll see uh, professionals doing, uh, well, let's just do it slower. Um, okay, well, you realize when you do it slower, you're changing all your force factors and also changing the intensity of those force factors. It's, it's like, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. It's like, yeah, but, you know, doing something slowly against no load is like nothing. <laughs> doing it slowly against excessive load starts to build up a load capacity close to doing it at high speeds against body weight. Uh, I think people greatly misunderstand how much load goes through the body when it's moving at a high velocity and then trying to change, you know, decelerate and change direction and that kind of thing. You start to see these loads go exponentially high. We see this with tendons all the time. Tendinopathies, uh, you know, where you, you, you treat them, you do an exercise program and then they blow up again. It's like, yeah, when you look at the load that a tendon takes during a high impact deceleration or jumping or plyometric type activity, it's so much higher than what they were loading them in, in their exercise program that it's just, again, too big of a gap there. And so, you know, that's why getting into heavy loads, when if you're doing something slow, you got to make sure that those loads are building up very heavy because when you add speed to, to their movement, you don't need much, you know, physical load because the deceleration, um, you know, again, that's, that's your force equals mass times acceleration. You know, you can put more mass on them. That's an easy way to control it because it's hard to control acceleration. So you just put more of mass and they'll get that adaptation. But then if you add acceleration, i.e. sporting activity, the mass doesn't need to be very high to get that same kind of force. And so if you're trying to get them to, to adapt to force and be tolerant of force, doing it with a, using a high mass while you have, which allows you to have a lot of control, uh, is a way to help bridge that before you get into higher and higher speeds. You going back to the healing, you mentioned how a lot of times people can fully return and hit these objective metrics and, and be at a hundred percent readiness. Uh, even if you were to check the MRI and there wouldn't be quote unquote healing, are there times when that's not the case? And from the kind of like traditional radiographic or imaging sense that does apply or is it always the the former oh meaning that is it sometimes that the mri is totally clean later no in the sense that you would base more of the return even more on the the mri or the kind of the traditional thought of the healing sense gotcha. yeah i mean I'm trying to think of like an extreme case, but even, you know, if, if, if you had an MRI of somebody's shoulder and it shows a big bank art lesion, uh, and you're like, man, I, th there's no way that this shoulder could be stable, but then their shoulder's totally stable. I I'm going to go with the fact that their shoulder's stable. I'm not going to worry too much about what that MRI shows. And, you know, this is always where, you know, MRI is a classic example of 
you don't do an MRI to quote unquote, see what's going on in there. You do an MRI to confirm your diagnosis. And so your diagnosis presents as what you're seeing, you know, clinically in your, in your exam, for example. So the patient comes in and says, yeah, my shoulder keeps popping out. Uh, every time I put my arm up, I feel hesitant and weak. Uh, I feel like my arm goes dead up there in those positions. And then, yeah, it's popped out a couple of times. Well, that's kind of screaming that somebody has a symptomatic, uh, labral tear, uh, a bank heart in particular. And it sounds like something that we need to do something about that what's on that MRI. So that's going to, uh, that's going to drive us to the MRI. The MRI is going to confirm or refute that diagnosis. And then that's going to build our plan of care from that. Um, but if somebody says, yeah, you know, I felt like my shoulder kind of shift a little bit, but you know, now it feels fine. And you force test them, the force looks great. You put them through all the different motions and everything and everything looks great. You have them go and participate in practice and everything. It's like, well, I mean, if there is a labral tear in there, it's not bad enough that we would probably do anything about it at this point. You know, there's not a good, you know, evidence of that being necessary in this type of situation. And so that's where, you know, we probably wouldn't order the MRI in the first place. And so, you know, contrasting that with, you know, you'll see, you know, somebody will strain a muscle, you know, they get a, you know, they come up short, you know, hamstring got pulled, quote unquote. Uh, I mean, you could do an MRI and it's going to show you that there's, you know, damage to the muscle. Uh, you know, a grade one, grade two, or, you know, whatever. Um, but the person's problem is that they can't generate force through their hamstring. And so what we can do is actually measure, well, how much force can you generate through that hamstring before you say, ouch, okay, well, here's a number. All right, let's work on seeing if we can, you know, again, applying the said principle, can we get that tissue to start to adapt to take that load again? Now, that doesn't mean that that injured area has to heal. It means that the hamstring as a complex needs to generate that force again. And so if it's generating that force and you do an MRI and there's still, you know, a grade one tear in that hamstring, but they have zero pain and they have full force production, I don't know what what the problem is. Uh, and I don't know what that MRI is necessarily going to tell me. Um, from that perspective. And we see this all the time. You know, you have an athlete that's 10 years in their career and they've got an old injury that doesn't bother them anymore. They do really well and you do an MRI and there it is. You can still see, oh yeah, we can see that you had a, an old hamstring injury there. Uh, it looks like years ago, you know, it's, it's kind of inert, not really doing anything at this point. Um, does that give you any problems? No. You know, that might tell me, well, let's just double check their force production. Cause I could say no. And then you check their force production and it's 50% of what the other side is like, wow, you've been doing a lot with very little. Um, to me, you know, sometimes athletes get concerned about that. Cause they're like, um, Oh, you're, you're finding a, a weak link. I have, it's like, no, if you're performing on the court, that's your weak link. You know, of, of court performance tells me, you know, that what this is telling me is we have an opportunity to make you better. Cause look how well you're playing with this deficit. Now let's get this deficit back. So again, this is not something to point out to say, this is a way that you're broken. This is something to point out to say, this is an opportunity for us to make you greater because look at how well you're playing with this problem uh, that you didn't, you know, I'm not one to go looking for diagnoses, so to speak, but I'm one to look for some low hanging fruit that we can pick up. Um, and again, that's what I always promise every athlete is like, look, we found this huge difference here. This does correlate, you know, this happens to be, you have a history of a hamstring injury. Your hamstring is just not as productive as the other side. Number one, let's see if we can get that back. Sometimes you do all this work and it just doesn't really come back. You know, it, it, it kind of is what it is. Well, for all we know, this is just kind of the way they are. They have an asymmetry that's just normal for them. And I'm not going to lose sleep over it because we, we did a good faith effort to change it. We, it wasn't changing. We changed, we tried a different approach, didn't change. You know, we tried a couple different ways. This just kind of is what it is. Is it the way they've always been? Or is it just, this is something that's not going to change. All right. Well then who cares at this point? Let's just keep on, you know, playing and doing your sport or, you know, the other thing, and I like to hide out, we can do an intervention. We can make your force production that much better. We can restore it completely. I don't know if you're going to use it because you've been functioning just well without it. 
Um, what most athletes say is when we do a program like that and we bring that thing back, they talk about all of a sudden they feel like they have another gear or they feel like they now can go in a direction that they were having trouble with before and they just kind of abandoned it. Uh, and they learn to not go that way anymore or not do that particular move anymore. And then by doing this, it's kind of reopened that, that thing that they used to have. And that's all we're looking for. Again, that gets that skill transfer thing. Me strengthening somebody's hamstring is not going to transfer to the court unless they explore and see that, oh, hey, this is an opportunity for me. And you just let that you know, very complex organism figure, start to figure out all the ways that it could apply that into, uh, into a task. You know, there are ways, you know, you want to get into that. When we talk about skill acquisition, there are ways you can try to drive certain adaptations from a skill side. Um, but you know, when you think of, you know, the thousands and thousands and thousands of ways that, the hamstring is involved in a move <laughs> and all the different moves that are possible. You can't train all of those specifically, but you can kind of, like we talked about before, get that. Well, here's the gist of it. Did you feel that hamstring engage? When, when we did it this way, did you feel like you had, how you had to use your hamstring? Yeah. I could kind of feel that. Oh yeah. That feels new. That feels like something. All right. Now go play with that. Um, and, and, you know, I talked to, especially at really high level athletes uh, at the professional level, I like to point out to them, it's like, I'm not a skills coach. Um, can I coach some skills? Sure. But you're at the highest level of your game. Like if you're an NBA athlete, um, that is very arrogant of me to think, you know, I, I, I'd like to think that I am at the top of my game as a rehab professional that can help you with this specific part. But it would be arrogant of me to think that I am at that same level as a skills coach. And uh, this athlete in particular needs a skills coach at that level. And so we're going to pull in, usually they already have a skills coach that they're working with. We're going to pull that skills coach in. I'm going to say, here's what I want you to try to kind of work on with them. Things that kind of look like this, because I'm trying to get him to apply what we developed capacity wise over here. And so go ahead and play with that a little bit and see what kind of comes up to you. And then you have a back and forth with that skills coach. What are you finding? Where, where are you finding that there's still a problem? It's like, yeah, when I ask him to do this one move, he seems to have an issue with that. It seems like he can't make that work. That could be a skill issue, but it could be a capacity issue. And so, again, that's where, you know, we uh, look at that as well. But I'm the same way with strength coaches, too. Um can I function as a strength coach? Absolutely. Can I put together a real nice basic program that's going to drive some adaptation from a performance perspective? Sure. But if this is an athlete at that high of a level, it's arrogant of me to act like I can be at that high of a level as not just a rehab professional, but a strength coach and a skills coach, et cetera, as a massage therapist, you know, all these other things. It's just like, we're going to pull as many specialists into the, these cases as, as we can. Um, you know, and make sure that I focus on what I'm good at and be the best at that. To that point, how do you decide when that transition or handoff of care is when it's time? And maybe we stick with the professional context where you're working with these elite professionals, working with elite athletes. I'm sure it varies depending on the situation and the time you're with the team or whatever the the, the, the specific incident is, but do you have a general heuristic or guideline of this is from a rehabilitation perspective where I would want to see them before I feel comfortable handing off to the SNC coach or integrating into the, the skills coach? Do you have any yeah. thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, it's right back to the said principle. Um, so remember, the said principle is always applying. So even right after surgery, we're still looking at the said principle. So, but we're creating a safe space for the said principle to not run amok, so to speak. You know, if we, if we just say no holds barred, you know, yeah, you just had, you just had a, uh, a labor repair in your shoulder, go throw a baseball as hard as you can. You're free to do that. No, that's, that's not creating a safe space for them. So you create the safe space, you know, you create this little box to say, these types of activities are okay. Uh, and so from day one, I like to be working definitely with strength coaches to say, here's what they can start messing with right now in the weight room. 
and let's get them doing it. Um, you know, uh, post-op ACL uh, reconstruction has had a bone patellar tendon bone autograph. You know, the second that swelling is down well enough, uh, we can start working on some hinge, uh, some RDL type things. And you know what? If they're feeling pretty good with it, I'm not going to give you a limitation. You take that as far as you feel comfortable with with them. Don't really do any squatting activities because, you know, I'm kind of weird like that. I don't like doing squatting activities early because they don't have enough quad to do it. Um, you know, they can mimic it, but they're not loading their quad because their quad is too, you know, quote, quote unquote off. And so, um, but that's an example of here's, here's a, a space, do your thing. I'm not going to tell you how to do your job. I'm going to give you the space that you can kind of play in. And then we just keep expanding that space out. And then it's always a two-way street with those professionals of, I've created this space. This is what I expect to happen. Let me know if you're getting any different feedback. Ideally, I'm not expanding the space to the point where I'm nervous that something could happen. You know, and, and this is also where, you know, your relationship with that strength coach, you know, or, or skills coach comes in where you may need to be at that session because you don't know that that professional understood what you were saying when you created that safe space. And so you want to be there as kind of that advisor. You know, I like that role of, I'm just there as an advisor to say, you know, that's, um, I'm concerned about that. Here's why I'm concerned about that. Uh, not just saying, don't do that. But, you know, going over, because again, they understand forces, they understand, you know, loads, they understand, um, you know, what makes something challenging, difficult and that kind of thing. And so just go over, here's why that's probably asking more than what this athlete has available to them right now. Um, and so you think you're teaching them one thing, but you're probably teaching them something else because they, they just don't have the capacity to do it the way you're asking them to. So they're going to find a way to, to do the task without actually doing the thing and, and you know humans are really good at that of finding a way especially that these higher level athletes they are so task oriented they will find a way to complete the task and make it look a lot like what you want it to um but if they don't have the capacity they've got to find a way around it and that that's why it's so important to to make sure you're in your kind of safe space for that phase of the rehab if you're brought in for a team or with a specific athlete and your role as the rehab professional is to make sure that they have the capacity and readiness to progress to subsequent stages of rehab or participation or practice or whatever it is. My understanding is you highly utilize if there's access as an isokinetic, some type of force testing, maybe uh, force plates. Those are all relatively like short duration based tests and mm -hmm. gives us information on at this point in time with this amount of force they can to tolerate or they have the capacity for this the let's go back to like maybe to the hamstring example if they have a hamstring pull you can do kind of a, a force based test maybe in a mid lever position or a long lever see how much force they can produce how much it hurts if it hurts at all compared to the other limb um and maybe some like pre injury data of theirs but from a Oh, this only hurts in the fourth and the end of like the fourth that, you know, quarter or whatever it is, whatever the sport, how do you determine capacity for like the duration of event? They've met the, the force requirements at, you know, a quick point in time, but do you test something that's more of a, how do they handle this throughout the game or throughout the series of games? Or is that where you have the the skills coach and the snc staff that's where they develop those you know broader and longer duration capacities yeah i'm going to lean heavily on those guys with that and and so you know typically when i'm brought in uh the way i kind of brand myself so to speak is as an applied biomechanist uh less of a rehab type thing because what i'm going to do is i'm going to come in and actually look at um what are the capacities this individual has? And so, you know, an example I would give is, um, you know, let's somebody, say somebody's got a uh, an Achilles pain that they get uh, when they play. And so the first thing I'm going to say is, okay, well, how much load can your Achilles take in the most classic loaded position, which is that seated soleus, I can get a really nice reliable reproducible uh, measure on that. And we may even have some baseline measure from the team. Uh, honestly, they, sh they prop, that's probably the one they would have got. 
And so they, a lot of times, you know, so you do that test and you see there's a, there's a big difference there. It's like, all right, well, we got to sol solve this first. And so we get that solved. And a lot of times, you know, for me, pff, I'm lazy. I'm going to get that solved. And I'm saying, all right, get back on the court, see how it feels. And a lot of times they're going to like, yeah, yeah, it feels a whole lot better, but you know, it's still when I do this particular kind of push off, I feel it. Okay. And so this is where kind of my skill set is, as my specialty skill set is, is I can take that, that, uh, athlete's narrative and I can bring it over to some sort of dynamometer, be it a force plate, a ice connect machine, handle dynamometer, something, and I can quantify what they're saying. Okay, so it may not show up on the soleus test. All right, well, now I need to do a custom test to try to see something. Now, all of a sudden, I lack reliability data, valid, you know, I lack all these things. So I'm not looking for subtle things. I'm looking for a big difference here. Um, and usually what happens is, is all of a sudden, there it is. It shows itself as a huge difference from one side to the other. And the athlete says, that's exactly what I feel. I felt it right there. Okay, got it. So let's say now we, we did it in standing on, you know, for, for calf and it's like, okay, yeah, that's, that's it. All right. So then we work on that. Now that's looking normalized or as normal as we can say based off this more unreliable test and then go ahead and get back out there. See if that solved it. And the athlete goes out. Yeah, it's a lot better, but now only when I curl to the left. Okay. So we need to put a diagonal load to it. Going back to those uh, that test, now we're going to do a diagonal load to it, and we've now found it there. And so you see, it's it's a lot of kind of you know picking it up that way. Now, when you start to get into, um, I only feel it like in the second quarter. I don't feel it at the beginning. A lot of times when we test them, their capacity is down, and the reason why they feel they don't feel it initially is they have enough capacity from a, you know, they're a strong individual, so. You know, 100% is a lot <laughs> and they're at 70%, which is a huge difference. You know, a 30% difference is huge, but that 70% is still a lot of force production. And so early on, they don't notice it, but by the second quarter or the third quarter, it starts to become symptomatic on them. That's still, that's not a quote unquote endurance thing that's still a base capacity thing. So again, like I was saying with the soleus test, is you go to the simplest, most obvious thing. And if you find it there, you're, that's most likely your thing. Go ahead and sort that out first, then put them back and see how it goes at that point. And so you see, it's a lot of, uh, I'm going to do the easiest test, the, the cleanest test first. If I find stuff there, I'm done. I don't need to get cute. And, and I'll tell you right now, <laughs> that's almost always the one it's always the easy one it's like oh well, okay here we go this this was the one all right and then once i get sorted out they're good enough they'll figure it out from there again because they're high level athletes and so you know making that handoff to that um you know as we're getting into you know then you can talk to performance staff you could definitely do your own you know conditioning test but you know i'm going to go to a perf the performance staff and say yeah go ahead and uh you know first off the performance staff has probably been working on conditioning from just general, you know, full body conditioning from, you know, cardio, that kind of thing as part of that safe zone that I, we had given them at the time was here. Yeah. Work on cardio in this space. And so they already know that answer and they, they'll already say, yeah, we still have some work to do and, and we have it on the bike, but we haven't gotten running yet. So we're, we're working on transitioning from the bike, to the elliptical or to a, you know, a, a unweighted treadmill to a, um, to full, you know, weight bearing, we're working on hard deceleration. So you see, it's all this kind of cascade of things. And, and I'm definitely involved with the understanding of how certain things are more uh, acceptable at a certain time than others. Um, but yeah, it, you know, this is where people get into, um, well, we need to work on training somebody when they're fatigued, you know, training, like, like landing mechanics, for example, when somebody's fatigued, because that's, well, first off, when somebody's fatigued, they probably don't have enough energy to tear something. They're not moving fast enough. <laughs> They're tired. The other thing is, if fatigue breaks down their movement strategies, the problem isn't the movement strategy. The problem is the fatigue. Work on their conditioning. So make it that they're not fatigued at the in the fourth quarter. You know, make it that they're still strong in the fourth quarter. That's a much easier thing to accomplish than fatiguing somebody in a workout. So you can then work on 
movement strategies. It's like, no, just, just work on their conditioning and make them condition better. And then they're going to have everything at their disposal. So again, it, it's still capacities from that perspective. That all makes perfect sense. Thanks for outlining that. Anything else with this topic of the set principle, um, things that you commonly see within the orthopedic uh, and sports rehab professions that you want to mm, clarify or address or provide more? No, I mean, uh, the reason I wrote the, this article, and you're probably hearing me kind of say this right now, the other principle I would say is, you know, the KISS simple, the, uh, principle of keep it simple, stupid. Uh, we get way too cute. We get way too advanced. I, uh, there's so many cases that I consult on that. It's just like it, it, they went past, they, they pass one of the first steps and they just assumed. And again, a lot of times they assumed because time had passed that they were past that. And now they're looking at hop testing and they're looking at, uh, the, the person on the court or on the field. Um, and it's like, no, 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 you go back to just basic Did they pass this most basic thing first. So go to that first and just double check that that's passed. Uh, because if it's not, what are you doing? You know, you, you haven't solved the, the most basic thing. And so don't make things harder on yourself until you have to. Um, that's, you know, over all my years of experience, that's the thing that keeps getting beaten into my head <laughs> uh, just from experience is back it up, back it up, back it up, back it up. Go to the most basic, simple thing and look there because it's almost always there. And that is what's making your more complicated intervention not work is because you didn't handle the simple thing well. Um, and usually what, what I'll find is there is a simple thing. We get that sorted. We get them moving towards a more complicated thing. And then when we start having problems with the complicated thing, go back to the simple thing and double check it. And nine times out of 10, it slid. Okay, so we're back here again. And then keep working way up. And if you find that you keep backsliding over and over again, then you start asking yourself, you know, like you, let's use that shoulder example again. You're trying to rehab somebody that's got a labral tear and it keeps backsliding. And it keeps going weak on you again. Okay, well, maybe there's something about that labral tear. And maybe we need to start talking to the surgeon because that can be the thing that keeps me backsliding. And so that's that's that other party that I'm always talking to is if I have a case that keeps sliding back and I keep that deficit keeps rearing up again, then I start talking to a surgeon as to, well, why is what is happening here? Is there something structural that that actually needs a surgeon's uh, hand to sort this out you know let's let's open up that conversation sometimes an injection or something like that might be required to to kind of move them past that um but that's really uh you know again it's it's the simple things it's always the simple people you know rehab professionals are always trying to find the the latest new gadget that's going to be the game changer for them it's like it's always right back to the most basic simple stuff if you just do that really really well again that 80 20 rule not to keep giving these these cliche principles um you're doing the 20 percent of work that's giving you 80 percent of the results it, and again people say well that's not everything it's like no but you got to make sure that got done that has to get done then you can do the other stuff that's that's adding gravy on top that's great but make sure you got the important stuff for sure i think that's a great place to stop Outside of the upcoming conferences for some of these professional organizations and finishing the pilot license situation, any other <laughs> things moving forward, ending 2023 or going into the new year? Yeah, redoing my, uh, I'm going to do, so for my online courses, I got that foundations course, which has uh, applying science to practice and, and some basic biomechanics and that kind of thing. That's a seven and a half, eight hour course. I, I am going to refresh that one at some point. Um, although it that's so foundational, hence the name foundations of practice that there's not a lot that needs to be updated to it other than just, you know, recording it better <laughs> because I'm getting better at the production side of things. Um, but, uh, the hip and knee course that I used to do, and that's still online right now, that's going to go down at some point, probably in the next year, we're working on recording a new one. Uh, the new one will just be knee. Um, but we're going to expand on, you know, some of what I was just talking about as to, you know, how do neural networks learn? Um, what can we learn from, um, computer science, um, and apply to the way humans learn? Um, like what mistakes have been made? Like when you look at 
teaching a ro robot how to move, so to speak. What is that process? You know, getting into reinforcement learning, looking at, you know, an agency, a policy, you know, all these different things that are used where you can actually peel back and see how these processes work. You know, I'm going to expand on that a whole lot and, and make, you know, a longer knee course. that's just talking about the knee. And again, it's not, the, the knee is the tool that we use to describe things. Um, but the, the course is about teaching skills, building load tolerance, thinking about biomechanics, and the knee is used as an example for it. So you could apply the same principles to just about any joint. Um, so that, that's the big thing that I'm working on. Um, and also we're bringing on more speakers onto the science PT.com. Um, got Brian Heiderscheidt coming on to do, uh, his running course. Uh, he's phenomenal. If you're not familiar with his work at university of Wisconsin and uh, science advisory board for the NFL. Uh, we also have a dynamometry one that's going to come on. Scott Morrison's going to do, uh, his course on our platform as well. Uh, so we have a lot of really cool things. Um, other speakers that just we don't have finalized yet, um, but there's some other really cool ones too. So yeah, sciencept.com, all that stuff's going to be there. That's all great. Well, thank you for doing all the things you do. I don't know how you juggle it all, but uh, a lot of students. <laughs> well, and I think E3 listeners get a discount. I think that's from the last time. Great. So you guys can dig up whatever that code is and sure. post that on this somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we'll put it back in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, the students and clinicians and uh, providers appreciate all you do. So thanks again, Eric. Yeah, appreciate that.